this is going to sound weird, but I, I've, I've been writing marriage books and sex books for, um, for quite a few years. My first book was out in 2003. I've been blogging, I've been speaking, but I never read a lot of Christian books. Hmm. I really didn't. Every now and then we'd read something if I was asked to endorse, right. um, but I never actually read a lot because I have this paranoid fear of plagiarism and I don't want to inadvertently <laughs> plagiarize someone. Right. And so I just always wanted the thoughts to be my own. So I just never read these books. And then in January, 2019, I was involved in this Twitter conversation about love and respect because some woman commented that she really needed respect, not just love. And then I jumped in there too. And I thought, you know, I've never actually read that book. And I happened to have a migraine one day. I didn't want to blog. I was just looking to goof off, but I had the book in my cupboard. So I pulled out love and respect. And I'm in the Myers-Briggs personality thing. I'm, I'm an N. I'm like a really big picture person. I'm not an S. I'm not a detail person. So mm. a normal human being, when they read a book, would start at the beginning. I don't do that. <laughs> so, so I flipped through the book and found the chapter I was most interested in, which was the sex chapter. Mm. And I read the sex chapter, and it was like an atomic bomb went off in my house because that changed everything for me, reading that, realizing that this is the best uh, other than the five love languages this is the best selling marriage book in the evangelical world and what it said about sex was this um if your husband is typical he has a need you don't have okay so men need sex and women don't um you have to give him sex no matter how you feel or he's very likely to have an affair if he has an affair it's your fault mm -hmm. at least partly um, you need to understand how much he battles lust if you expect him to understand your body image issues. And that was it. Hmm. There was nothing in there about sex being more than physical. In fact, he even said that the purpose of sex was physical release, like was a man's physical release. Hmm. There was nothing about the, it being a mutual knowing as the Bible talked about in Genesis four, there was nothing about intimacy. There was nothing about the fact that she could experience pleasure at all. In fact, one of the reasons that, that he gave for women sex is why would you deprive him of something which takes so little time and makes him so happy? And I just have a hard time believing that someone who is trying to sell women on how great sex is would say that it takes very little time, <laughs> considering that most women take a lot more time than men do right. if they're going to feel good. So women's experience was completely missing from the conversation. And um, as we got, I started blogging about this, I, I took it further than just sex. I, I took a look at how he treated abuse. Um, yeah. And then we sent, it was so bad that we sent a report off to focus on the family of, cause I had, I had hundreds in that one week, I had hundreds of women sharing their stories with me of how they had been abused and how this book had enabled their abuse. Right. We wrote to focus on the family who promotes it. I had been on the focus on the family show three times. So I yeah. knew them and I thought they would listen. They ignored us. And so we decided if they can ignore several hundred women, maybe they won't be able to ignore 20,000. And that's why we did the survey. Wow. So, uh, yeah, so this all starts with focus on the family then. It's a, it's a good chunk of the, the Yeah, love the, and respect part. and focus on the family, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's really that's really cool. You you mentioned abuse. So you mentioned, obviously, that's been the, the crux of my show. Like, it's been just what, you know, what fuels abuse? Like, what is it that's causing um, abuse? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times those conversations, they can go back to, blaming a lot of things other than the abusers. So we can get into, you know, there's a long laundry list of things people like to point to and say, well, maybe this is why. Um, but when I, when I first got introduced to you a few months ago and like, I've been kind of just, you know, like browsing here and there looking at this. Um, I think a lot of what you, you go over and a lot of the misconceptions that you discuss, and we mentioned so many of them treating women like objects, treating women like their property, um, when you have that mindset preached, I think it, I think it opens the door for a lot of abuse to be justified. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, a lot of the abuse we're seeing in churches, which is a, a lot. I mean, we're seeing even in the Southern Baptist convention right now, you know, we're seeing a, a pretty heated conversation mm -hmm. about abuse there. Um, a lot of it goes back to the pulpit. And again, every abuser is responsible mm -hmm. for themselves. You can't, you can't blame, um, they'll be quicker than anybody to say, well, it was the preaching or it was the pornography or it was this. Uh, the reality is a lot of people sit in these environments and don't abuse. So there's, there is some level to that. You have to take mm -hmm. personal responsibility, but what factor do you think 
our, um, you know, our views of sex and evangelical culture plays in abuse. And like, do you think that that's a key factor in why we see so much abuse starting to come out to the surface right now? I have several issues. Um, one of course is just this idea that women exist to, um, prop up men. And so then if, if he feels like he's being disrespected, then she isn't doing her part. And that Mm. certainly results in abuse. One of the things we looked at in our survey and in our book, The Great Sex Rescue, uh, was marital rape. Mm -hmm. Um, When we looked at when we when we looked at all our books, oh, and by the way, everyone listening, we we created a 12 point rubric of healthy um, sexuality, healthy sexual teaching, healthy messages with along with a scorecard. So you could score between zero and four. And we explained what a zero, one, a two, a three, and a four would look like. And then we applied that to all of these books. And if you want to see that rubric and that scorecard, see how different books scored, there'll be a link that I will give you. And you can share that Perfect. with all of your listeners and you can download that because it's kind of interesting. And it, it shows it shows you a few of the stats about the great sex rescue. And then you can get the book to see more. But um, one of the one of the questions that we were looking at was, do these do these books, do our Christian resources even cover the concept of consent? The fact that she is allowed to say no. And um, as I said, we looked at all of these best-selling marriage books, but we did look at a secular book as our control book. Hmm. So, do, and we applied our rubric to that. And the secular book was John Gottman's. It was the best-selling secular one, John Gottman's Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. On our rubric, you could score up to 48 points. John Gottman scored 47 Love and Respect scored zero. So our best-selling secular books scores 47 out of 48. Our best-selling evangelical one scores zero. Now, there were good ones, like Gift of Sex also scored 47, Intimate, uh, intimate Issues, Sacred Marriage, Boundaries of Marriage, those all scored well. But a lot of our Christian resources scored really badly. And none of them, even the, the ones that, that scored well, None of them, except for the secular book, mentioned consent. None of them mentioned, and some of them did give reasons why women might say no, but most of them did not. Mm -hmm. Most of them used the do not deprive verses that you talked about to say that you are never allowed to say no. And let me just give you one one quick story from the act of marriage. Uh, and I hadn't remembered reading this. I, I must have read it before I was married. But as I was reading the book again for this, it's like, okay, this makes so much sense. Why, why I have such a residual hatred for this book. But Tim LaHaye was telling the story of this woman who's getting married, this young woman who's getting married, and her aunt Matilda comes to her and tells her that sex is terrible. And Tim LaHaye says, sometimes people will wreck sex for you because they'll tell you sex is terrible. And this is just such an awful thing to do to young people. And he tells the story of Aunt Matilda, how when Aunt Matilda married, she married uh, a farmer who was much older than her, and he had to hold her down and rape her while she was kicking and screaming on their wedding night. And this continued throughout their, their married life, that she never wanted sex. And so he had to always hold her down while she was screaming. And, and so this is why she didn't like sex and how awful is it that she told this girl that she didn't like sex. And then Tim LaHaye says this, he talks about the husband as being clumsy and older, but how sad is it that Matilda and her equally unhappy husband have never been able to enjoy a good sex life. So he says that the rapist is equally unhappy as his victim, and he doesn't see this as a problem. And I read the fourth edition of the Act of Marriage. I know that book was published in the 70s, but the edition I read was published in the late 90s, and nobody thought to take that anecdote out. Mm. 